of God. Understand then that you and I no longer have to worry, feel like, hope, or even wonder whether or not we know the Lord or are his friends. Because the word of God itself is clear that we can both know and be assured that we are. And this within itself gives us all the confidence we'll ever need in order to faithfully endure all the trials, troubles, sufferings, griefs, sorrows, doubts, challenges that we have to face in this life. You see, it's hard to live a victorious life as we learned in our first, second, and third John and Jude class on yesterday. It's hard to live a victorious life when you are not sure of your salvation. Amen, somebody. God wants us to be assured, wants us to be confident that we not only know him, but that we also are his friends. Is that all right? See, it's okay for us to be each other's friends, uh, but I'd rather be a friend of God. Is that all right? I know that God, and you know that God is a friend that won't turn on you, won't talk behind your back. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? Are we getting this? And that's why I want to call your attention to that which was read in our hearing this morning from 1 John chapter 2. This is a familiar passage, but there's so much that this Apostle John, through the Holy Spirit, he's known as the Apostle of Love, is trying to tell us. And John, even though he is known as the Apostle of Love, as we learned on yesterday, John tells it like a T.I. is. Amen, somebody. We don't need someone to tickle our ears. We need to be told the truth because time is short. We're not here trying to impress nobody, entertain no one. We need the word. We need the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? So I call you to 1 John chapter 2 where we find the reassurance as children of God that we know God that we are his friends, but before we examine whether or not you and I are a friend to God, the important thing is recognizing, amen, for yourself and for myself, that God has always been a friend to us first. Look with me in verses 1 and 2 of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse number 1. If you have it, say amen. Apostle, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Thank you, Jesus. Is that all right? Advocate meaning we have a helper. We have an intercessor. We have a comforter. We have a consoler. Is that all right? It speaks specifically to the fact that Christ Jesus serves as a legal advocate of defense. There's a lot of defense lawyers in this life, but none like Jesus. Is that all right? He serves as a legal advocate of defense who comes to the spiritual aid and provides the evidence, the pardoning of sin, which stands up in the court of God. 
on behalf of all those who are truly his and belong to him. You see, in the court of God, we all stand guilty. Amen, somebody. The preponderance of the evidence is not in our favor. Are we getting this? But Jesus, as our advocate, produces evidence which pardons us. And the evidence that he produces is his own blood. We have an advocate with the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Notice, he himself is the propitiation. And I'm glad that the translators in the King James translated this into this word because it's, it's critical. Propitiation speaks to Christ himself being the ultimate and only offering, only offering, only offering, which God fully accepts as a means for appeasing, atoning for, and satisfying his wrath and anger against our sins which have offended him. You see, you and I, by our sins, have offended God. And we stand for those sins, we stand in condemnation. Amen, somebody. We all deserve the wrath of God. And watch this. God's wrath has to be satisfied. God just can't just say, well, I'm just going to overlook that. It has to be atoned for. So it's nothing but the blood of Christ that has satisfied the wrath of God that otherwise is upon you and I. And that's why it's so critical that you and I who have obeyed the gospel and are working to live faithful lives reach out to those in the world because for those who haven't obeyed the gospel, if they die, they die with the wrath of God on them. It's not about being good. Some of us will, will say things like, well, you know, I'm not that bad. It's not about goodness and badness. All right. It's about being made new. When God looks at his creation, He's not looking at who's good and bad because all things are sin. He's looking at who has the son of my, the, the blood of my son on them and who doesn't. And if you don't have the blood of Christ on you, you stand condemned. Amen, somebody. So notice, he's a friend to us first. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. So he's been a friend to you and I long before we ever thought about being a friend to him. And this is why John later says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. See, no matter how good you and I can be today, Amen, somebody. We only love because he loved us first. Amen, somebody. Proverbs 18.24 says, a person of too many friends comes to ruin. You say, why are you reading this? Because this is important. Because we, a lot of times in life, try to seek to be friends to everybody. But everybody ain't going to be your friend. Watch this. No matter how good you are to people, everybody don't like you. Amen, somebody. Now, who's the standard? Jesus is the standard. He did no sin. He did nothing wrong. And people hated his guts. A person of too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
You say, what is the point of that scripture? God is telling us in that Proverbs 18, 24, it's not in the multitude of so-called friends we have in this life, but in the true loving friend, Christ Jesus, whose love is stronger and purer than any and all the relational and familiar ties that we can ever have in this life that we find our true help. We think that the more friends we have, the more homeboys we have, the more help we have. And you only grow up to learn. Have you ever noticed the older you grow, the less friends you have? Amen, somebody, because you discover that everybody really don't like you. And everyone who pretends that they like you only value you for what they can get out of you. Amen, somebody. And not only does not everybody like you, that, but you don't even like yourself sometimes. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? So true help is not found in the multitude of friends. Sometimes we want to be liked by everyone. If you're really going to serve the Lord, get used to being alone. And this is why our Lord says, John 15 and verses 12 through 14, John 15, 12 through 14, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. No one has died for you except for Jesus Christ. I know we love it when people say, I'll die for you. They lying. (laughs) Oh, I love you so much. I just died for you. They lying. (laughs) Amen, somebody. All right. But notice what Jesus says in verse 14. He says, you are my friends. If you keep on obeying what I command you. So notice then the test of a true Christian. Notice then the test to where we can test ourselves to see if we're truly a friend to God. Y'all ready to take the test? Back to 1 John chapter 2. Verse number three says, now by this we know or are assured that we know him if we keep his commandments. That what your Bible says? Now by this we know, we are assured, that's what that know means, that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now look at this second, know him. This know him means coming to learn, coming to recognize, coming to realize something or someone, but notice how, experientially, all right? It's a firsthand knowledge that comes through only, only through a personal and intimate relationship. Are y'all getting that? Know him comes only through a personal, intimate relationship. It's time we graduate on and move on to from acquaintance with God to intimacy with God. Amen, somebody. Our Lord said in his prayer in John 17, the gospel of John 17 and the verse 3, our Lord said, this is what he prayed for. He said, and this is eternal life, or this is salvation, that they may, notice, know you and know, know you, the only true God, and know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In other words, 
Salvation will not be ours unless we truly, truly know the Father and the Son. And that cannot happen without an intimate, intimate relationship, personally. Not through somebody else. You can't know God off of grandmama's relationship with God. Amen, somebody. You can't know God off of your brothers or your sisters or your mamas. No one, you have to cultivate and develop an intimate, personal, intimate relationship, God, for yourself. Amen, somebody. Do we know him? You see, not only is that important because sometimes we get so caught up in the world's way of things, because in this life we want to be known. Amen, somebody, Brother Willie. We want to know how many followers we have. How many likes I got. Because we want to be known. We want people to see what we got, who we are. Amen, somebody. In this life, we boast in people knowing who we are. However, listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9.24, the word of God says, But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So if you're going to boast about something, amen, somebody. If you're going to post something, post that you know the Lord. Amen, somebody. And for those of you who don't post, if you're going to talk about something, you're going to brag about something, brag that you know the Lord. Amen, somebody. I don't want to just pick on the people who are on social media. I, I know y'all people. We always talking about people on social media. I'm just picking. But notice, verse 3, again says, now, by this we know or are sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep. If we keep. This is the most crucial term because it is a present and active term. Meaning that it's ongoing and continual. It's a military term meaning to guard, to maintain, to observe, to keep an eye upon, to give full attention to, to keep in, intact spiritually in one's heart and mind. And specifically, it speaks to holding fast continually in order to protect from loss or injury. So in other words, just because you start off with something doesn't mean that you'll maintain it. It can be lost. Amen, somebody. So that's why he says we have to keep. We have to hold fast to. We have to maintain. We have to continue to give our full attention to in order to keep intact. And therefore, the point is, at this time, you had those, as we learned on yesterday again, you had those who reveled in having special knowledge as Christians. They called them Gnostics. They reveled in and prided themselves on thinking that they knew more than everybody else. Amen, somebody. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can think that we know everything that other people don't know. So... What John is saying here through the Holy Spirit is, while many boasted of their knowledge of God, 
the Holy Spirit reveals and makes it clear that true knowledge of God, watch this, because he says if we keep his commandments, right? He reveals and makes it clear that true knowledge of God is only evidenced and proven by one's obedience to Christ Jesus. You and I can say it all we want to, but action speaks louder than words. And this is why the Holy Spirit through, t through Timothy, oh, I'm sorry, through Paul to Titus says in Titus 1, 15 and 16, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciousness are corrupted. Notice, they claim to know God, but by their actions, by their actions, by their actions, they deny him. Did y'all get that? Another translation says, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. Another translation says, such people claim to know God, but their actions prove they really don't. Amen, somebody. So that's why he goes on in verse 4 in 1 John chapter 2 to say, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So you say, well, what's the point and what's the emphasis here? The point and emphasis here is on the importance of matching the profession of what we say with the practice of our life and behavior. It shouldn't be mixed matched. Amen, somebody. Your mouth shouldn't be saying something that your life is not exhibiting. Isn't there a song, young people, walk it like you talk it? Something like that. Something like that. That, good, that close enough? Walk it like you talk it? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. You see, matching your profession with the practice. All right? Because... John is saying that there, there were those then, just as there are those now, whose relationship with God extends no further than just, watch this, an intellectual exercise or an emotional experience. Did y'all get that? There's some, and we have to just make sure that we look at ourselves. Don't point the mirror to somebody else. Is your relationship with God, is the extent of it just an intellectual exercise or, or just simply an emotional experience? In other words, many people would say, I know God or I know that God, uh, I know that I am in God and God is in me. You, you, have, you know people say that all the time. Uh, uh, people get up sometimes and say, uh, uh, giving glory to, to, to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who I know I'm in and he's in me. I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. It's not about how you feel. It's about what you know. Amen. Knowing, Jesus said, you shall know the truth. Is that all right? You see, again, people may say, I know God. Oh, I know that I am in God and God is in me. But watch this. At the very same time, they have no conscience of their obligation of obedience in life to that very same God at all. So how can I say I know him? How can I say that I'm in him and he's in me? without a conscience of a life of obedience to that same God that I say I know. How can that be? But watch this. Especially 
in our relation to our love for one another. Now, if you don't listen to anything in this lesson, listen to this. Christianity, Christian discipleship starts at home. Did y'all hear me? Christianity, Christian discipleship starts at home in our relationships with one another. First John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Then he says in 1 John 4, 20 and 21, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. How can you love God and you damn me? Notice then, 1 John 4, 21, and he has given us this command, not an option, a command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I say again, Christian discipleship starts at home in our relationships with one another. And I'm not just talking about that of a marriage. I'm speaking to the singles as well. How are your relationships with people? As we talked this morning in Sunday school about anger. Amen, somebody. And how Satan gains access through anger. How can we truly be the salt and light and let our light so shine Amen, when we're just talking the talk and not walking the walk. How do we do that? We have to surrender our lives. And truth be told, we're still struggling with surrendering. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. So our prayer should be, God, Don't just fix this situation, fix me so that I can deal with this situation. Because the situation is not the issue, I am the situation. And until I fully yield myself to you and surrender myself to you to become more like your son, I'm going to have issues. So help me with me. We want God to change everybody else but us. You ever notice that? Well, if if she would just change, if he would just change, if they would just change, no, change. A lot of work to transform you. So watch. Again, he says in verse 4, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. You know what the Holy Spirit is truly saying? He who keeps on saying I know him and keeps on not obeying his commandments keeps on being a liar. And the truth keeps on being not in him. That's what he's truly saying. Amen, somebody. And as our brother prayed for, from James chapter 1 and verse 22, but don't just listen to God's word. You must obey what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. But watch this. We sometimes think that change happens by osmosis. I can just sit here, listen to the word of God, then I'm changed. No, you have to put it into practice. This is hard. 
as we said this morning in Sunday school, being a, there's nothing convenient about being a Christian. It's a sacrifice. You have to kill this man every day. This beast. This thing's just, just, it's not subject to God. So you got to ask God, God, help me with, with killing myself today. I know that sounds weird, but it's the truth. Because this thing has a mind of its own. You want me to tell you? If that got a mind of you ain't want to come here this morning, did you? You wanted to stay in bed, didn't you? Amen, somebody. You didn't want to come down here. Amen, somebody. If the flesh had its way, we'd still be in bed with some pancakes or something. Is that all right? But when the Holy Spirit governs this thing, the Holy Spirit says, get yourself up, your lazy self. Your, get up. We're going to glorify God who gave his life for you. When you were sad and sorry and didn't care nothing about him. Notice then as we hasten. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, whoever keeps his word. You see, God is faithful to his promises. God rewards us. It's, this is amazing. God rewards us and benefits us even when we're, we're not responsible for it, for doing it. Are y'all getting this? In other words, we have to ask God to, to help us do what he wants us to do, but then he still rewards us for doing it. Did y'all get that? He helps us with us, but then rewards us for doing it. So in honesty, true honesty, we don't deserve anything, even with what God blesses us with. We don't deserve it even when we obey, even when we follow his will. We don't deserve it because he helps us to do that. We just have to be honest and truthful enough to ask God to help us to do it. So maybe in honesty, we should say that God rewards us for asking and trusting that he's able. Is that all right? But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Another translation says, but whoever habitually or continually keeps his word and obeys his precepts and treasures his message in its entirety, in him the love of God has truly been perfected, which means it is completed and has reached maturity. Perfected. Understand what it means. It does not mean sinless. Get that out of your head. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen, somebody. None of us are sinless. But as I always say, as we grow in the Lord, we should be sinning less. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? Are we getting this? We're not to take advantage of God's graciousness and his kindness towards us. Is that all right? So this perfection here, the love of God being perfected in us, is means to accomplish, complete, bring to an end goal, reach an end stage. Spiritually, it speaks specifically to the working of something spiritually through an entire process. In other words, it's a work, y'all, and it's a good work. Amen, somebody. Sometimes we we have that microwave mentality where we just want to be grown-up Christians. You ain't going to get that. You want to be spiritually mature by tomorrow. It took you 40, 50 years to be where you are. You think you're going to be like that tomorrow? No, you're not. Amen, somebody. It's a process. In order to reach that final phase or conclusion, 
And guess how long that takes? You say, well, how long that going to take? All your life. All your life. Amen, somebody. Keep on living. Because at the end of the day, when we keep on living, we still need the grace of God. But watch this. While the love of God is perfected, we need to understand that sin, on the other hand, is just the opposite. Sin, on the other hand, is just the opposite because it has no perfection. Did y'all get that? Listen, sin has no perfection because it has no end, it has no goal, it has no aim. Because the definition of sin is missing the mark. It's missing the mark. Are y'all getting this? And therefore, therefore, obedience is the exponent of the proper carrying out of the love which exists in one's heart. The only way that our love is carried out is by our obedience. Not because we think about it. Think about all the things you thought about doing this week that didn't get done because you didn't act on it. A lot of us started last Sunday, the first day of the week, with good intentions to do things that were never accomplished or reached because you didn't carry them out. That don't mean you didn't think about it. Amen. That don't mean you didn't think about sister so-and-so and and reaching out to her and and calling her and encouraging her or reaching out to brother so-and-so or visiting someone or, or calling and encouraging or sending someone a card. That don't mean you didn't think about it. But our love is only carried out by what? Our actions. Our actions. All right? So understand then, when it comes to our obedience, the love of God constrains us to do that. Amen, somebody? True love for God is not expressed in intellectual knowledge. It's not expressed in sentimental feeling. And it's not expressed in our emotional experiences, but only in obedience. I want to close by asking you to go with me to to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 14. Watch this. Gospel of John, chapter 14. Our true love for God is not expressed in intellectual knowledge. Knowing Bible don't show that you know God. Doesn't show that you love God. Just shows that you know some information. That's all that shows. Amen, somebody. Having emotional or sentimental feelings about God doesn't prove that you love God. We can sit up and cry, oh, I love the Lord so much. That don't prove you love God. I'm not trying to be insensitive or dismissive, all right? Just because we have emotional experiences, amen, somebody. Well, I just felt God today. That don't prove that you know God and love God. Amen, somebody. Let's allow God to tell us how we love him. Amen, somebody? Because when it comes down to it, obedience doesn't just show that we know God. Obedience also shows that we love him. John 14. Look with me in verse 15. If you have it, say amen. Amen. If you really love me, Jesus is talking. You will keep and obey my commandments. That what he said? He didn't say you will cry. He didn't say you'll be able to quote scripture. He said, if you really love me, 
you will keep and obey my commandments. That's what the Lord said. Verse 21 says, those who keep my commandments and obey them are the ones who truly love me. He didn't say those who quote scriptures, those who have emotional experiences. He said, those who keep my commandments and obey them are the ones who truly love me. And because they love me, my father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Thank you. Jesus. Verse 23 says, if anyone truly loves me, he will keep and obey my word or my teaching and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. You see, our obedience I close with this. Our obedience is not so much, hear what I'm saying, because it's required. Our obedience is required. But our obedience is not so much about him needing to receive our love. Are y'all getting this? Not that God is on his knees begging for us to love him. That's the least we should do because of what he's done for us. But our obedience is truly about the evidence and assurance that we abide and remain in his love. For what he's done for me, I want to make sure that I try to do the best I can do. And I know my best will never be good enough. But I want to try, Christine, to live the best I can. To show him that I love him so that he can keep on loving me. That I can re remain in the body of his love. You say, well, you got Bible for that? Glad you asked. John 15, 10. Our Lord says. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Don't you want to stay in his love? Can you imagine trying to navigate this life without the love of God? When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Notice, just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. As a man in his humanity, Jesus never wanted to disobey and displease his father. That's why on the cross, when he had your sin and my sin on him, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced his father turning his back on him because of you and me. 
What a love. And whoever I have to turn my back on in this life, whatever I have to turn my back on in this life, to show him that I love him, I'm willing to do it. We have to recognize that sometimes we just got to be like Lot. We have to keep it moving. You ever notice with Lot, that was his wife? He kept it moving. His daughters, that was their mother, they kept it moving. I'm not telling us to give up on people. Not telling us to dog people out and disown people. Not telling us that. But whatever you need to do to please God, do it. Because he's given up everything for you. I've said enough. You not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even if you think you have. Check again. Because men are saying a lot of things today. Amen somebody. Well you can do this and be saved. Well you can do that and be saved. What did the master say? Let's go back to the Bible. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible says, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We've tried our best not to give you nothing this morning but the word. Amen, somebody. Not our opinions, not our ideas, not any type of entertainment. Give you the word. Go back and check it for yourself. Don't take my word for it because I'll be standing in judgment with you. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. In other words, there will be no faith without the word of God being taught or preached. Where there is no word of God, there will be no Christians. That faith that we hear and receive from the word of God produces a belief within us. We have to believe what we heard. Amen, somebody. Jesus said in John 8, 29, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That belief leads us to a change of heart. To a change of heart. To where we make up our mind that we stand in need of a savior and we no longer want to live the way that we're living and that we can't help ourselves. We need help with that. Amen, somebody. I always say, and I'll say it again. I know y'all sick of hearing this, but the church is a hospital. We all are sick with sin. Amen, somebody. We're not here because we got it together. We're here because we come to the physician, the great physician, who's able to heal us. Amen, somebody. When we repent, we're then commanded to confess, Romans 10, 9 and 10, for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, unto salvation, unto, meaning you're on your way, on your way you're not there yet. Because you'll hear many people on TV tell you, well, uh, say this prayer, ask God into your heart, and I believe you've been saved. And that's what they say. I believe you've been saved. The Bible don't say that. We ought to believe the Bible. The Bible says, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for you are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized, notice, into Christ, have put on Christ. So what puts you and I into Christ, what puts Christ on us, is our obedience in the final step of being baptized into water. That's not holy water, that's just H2O. But the master told us to get in that water. 
so that he can work his work of operation to create us to be new creatures in Christ Jesus. And when we come out of that water now, we can begin to learn how to live right. Unlearn all that mess we've been taught all of our lives and learn to live like Jesus. Consider where you are as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement. Why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you now.